to end our discussion of circuits by talking about examples of circuits in real life. Okay, so it's not hard, I guess, to imagine how circuits and electricity operate in your real life, but I wanna give you some specific examples. Here's some specific examples of resistor capacitor circuits in real life. For example, the flash bulb on a camera. So you store up charge in a capacitor and then the capacitor is connected to the flash bulbs on your camera. And whenever you're ready to take a picture that requires a flash, those you press the button and then those capacitors immediately release all that charge and it sends a flash of light. And um, that flash of light, how long it lasts is based on the resistance of the circuit and um, you know the capacitance of the capacitor storing that charge. A discharging capacitor is what allows you to get the intense flash of light that you need for stop motion photography to get the motion in that very millisecond or even microsecond, for example, of a hummingbird flapping its wings. Defibrillators are examples of RC circuits. Um, roadway flashers, you know, when um, someone uh, has an accident on the side of the road and you have the um, devices that you set out to flash and blink on the side of the road. Pacemakers um, are examples of RC circuits. You know, my dad and my grandma both have pacemakers um, and they work by, there's a battery in the pacemaker and there's capacitors in there that store charge. And whenever your heart needs it, it you know, releases that charge um, stored on, on those capacitor plates to send an electrical signal to your heart. Our bodies, our entire bodies are electrical, are, are electrical circuits. Neurons and nerve impulses work with, um, you know, current going through them, a potential difference across them. And sometimes the membranes can behave like resistors and they could also behave like capacitors too. So our bodies are great examples of electrical circuitry. By the way, my shirt says, stand back. I'm going to try science. <laughs> so I thought it was appropriate to wear for a physics lecture. Um, so here's some examples of parallel circuits in our real life. Uh, one great example is a three-way light switch. So here's kind of a schematic of the inside of a three-way light bulb. Um, there are three different um, options uh, to choose from for um, the way in which switches operate inside the three-way light bulb. So for example, we've got electricity coming in from the wall through the circuitry. And then here's where we're connecting the circuit um, to the bulb itself. And then we have these three switches here that can complete the circuit. So whenever your lamp is off, you know none of those switches are closed, they're both open. But whenever you have the three-way light bulb at its lowest setting, you flip the switch and um, both of the switches, you know, are going to knock down one notch. Then this top switch is going to connect and it's going to complete the circuit through here. Okay, so you get a small amount of current running to your bulb. So you're going to have a dim level of brightness. Okay. Then you want medium brightness. You click the switch twice, okay? So then um, those switches both flip to the medium setting here. So this top one flips to the medium setting. It's not connecting to complete any circuit. But this bottom switch connects here um, and then it completes a circuit where um, it allows more current to flow than whenever we were connected up here for our a lowest setting on the three switch light bulb. And then whenever you want your light bulb to be the brightest level, this these switches knock down one, two, three, one, two, three, okay? And then both of these switches are connecting to complete the circuit. And then you get even more current rushing through your light bulb. So in that way, you can selectively have a low, medium and high level of brightness for your light bulb. Um, here are some examples of how you can have parallel circuits in your house and how you can use devices like um, circuit breakers and fuses to protect the electricity or, or the electrical items in your home. Um, so in a circuit breaker, most houses 
or buildings will have a circuit breaker. My apartment has a circuit breaker. Um, it's kind of a door that you open and it's got a bunch of um, switches coming in for the different rooms in your house. Okay, so the current comes through here into the circuit breaker. And for every little room of your house or segment of your house, there's the circuit breaker switch here. And when the current to a particular room of your house, when the current in a circuit for a particular room in your house exceeds 15 amperes, the circuit breaker acts as a switch and it opens the circuit. It's um, kind of a little automated switch that will open whenever it detects a current that's too large. And then that will open, it will shut off the electrical flow to that room in your house. And that will protect any electronic devices that you have in that room. Now, um, let's see here. Here's an example of the little things that are kind of inside the circuit breaker that can break that circuit. These are resettable. You don't have to replace them. Um, basically, um, so here's, I know it's kind of hard to see. Here's a schematic. I took this from your textbook of a particular circuit breaker. So when there's too much current flowing into the circuit breaker, it gets overheated. And there's um, a little strip in there, um, this here by metallic strip where one part of it, if it gets too hot, will um, bend in a different way than the other part of it. So if one part of it gets too hot, it's gonna expand. So we learned a little bit about last semester, how um, um, uh, you know, metals, for example, can expand whenever they get hot. So whenever that um, uh, piece of metal gets too hot because there's too much current flowing through it, it will bend in a particular way that will break the contact here for the current to flow through the switch. And then that will shut off the current. And it just sort of knocks it off um, from being in contact with the circuit to the rest of the house. And you can just go back in and flip a switch and it will reset itself. Now a fuse is um, inside a fuse, there's um, a little piece of metal that has a low melting point. And you can get different fuses that have these little pieces of metal that melt whenever a particular amount of current is running through them. And often these are placed inside electrical devices themselves. For example, our voltmeters have little fuses inside them. And if too much current is flowing into the voltmeter, then um, there's a little fuse in there that will break and it will um, stop the flow of electricity into the device or protect the electronics inside the device. And so fuses are things that have to be replaced because you would actually melt this piece of metal rather than bending it like in a circuit breaker. And so then um, you have to throw it out and put a new um, fuse in there. You can also play around with fuses in the FET simulations if you would like to try that. There are um, in the little left hand column, there are fuses in there that you can bring in. You can set the current at which that fuse will break and it will stop the flow of current within the circuit. And finally, I wanna talk about uh, light bulbs. <laughs> For example, we learned that whenever resistors get hot, their resistance goes up, okay? So as a filament light bulb ages, they tend to give off less light. Here's an example of a standard filament light bulb that are slowly being replaced by like LED light bulbs. But um, this is a tungsten filament light bulb. So inside here, we've got the currents coming through these metal prongs and suspended between those metal prongs is a piece of tungsten. When current is flowing through it, it gets hot and it glows, it emits light. And that's what has been lighting our world for a very long time. Okay, so the high temperatures that these tungsten filaments can, can reach when current is flowing through them, evaporate this tungsten from the filament over time. And then that decreases the radius of that filament that's there. So when you have a smaller radius, we increase the resistance. As we saw um, previously, how the resistance of a material is dependent on its cross-sectional radius. So if you decrease the radius, you increase the resistance, but you keep the potential the same, you have to decrease the current from Ohm's law. V is equal to IR. If V stays the same, 
and R gets bigger, the resistance gets bigger, then the current has to diminish. So over time, your light bulb is going to get dimmer because of the evaporation of the tungsten. Light bulbs like this often fail right after you flick them on. Um, usually that's when the majority of the light bulbs that I've had in lamps around my house go off or, you know, when they fail is whenever I flip the switch. Okay, why does that happen? Well, as the filament warms, we learned that the resistance rises as the temperature goes up. Higher resistance, same potential, our current decreases. So that means that the power delivered to the light bulb also decreases, but the voltage applied remains the same. The resistance of the filament is lower whenever it's turned on because it's cooler, which leads to a higher current and a large amount of power that gets delivered at that moment. And this current spike, this initial current spike is what causes the light bulb to fail initially whenever you flick it on. 